Well, hello everyone. Welcome. Um, it's great to see you all here today. My name is Laurent Dubois. I'm the academic director here at the Kirsch Institute of Democracy. We're glad you, you found us and I uh, hope you'll come back. Um, we're delighted to, to uh, start our first event. This is actually our first event of the year at the Carson Institute. Um, also the first in this series called Touchstones of Democracy. And then we couldn't have two better guests. We're delighted that you can join us. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just say a few words about the series and what we do here and then introduce them. And then hand it over to you. So the Touchstones of Democracy series here is, is uh, sponsored by the NOW Lab on the history and principles of democracy. We try to look at various key moments, texts, people in the history of democracy. We've had talks on Jose Marti, uh, on Tocqueville, Edmund Burke, and others, um, as well as contemporary questions. And a lot of the faculty here at UVA are almost all, often engaged in these conversations, sometimes with guests from outside. Um, this fall, we'll have two more. We're kind of, this fall is focused a little bit around sort of eight, 19th, 18th century Europe and the Americas. So we'll have an event at the beginning of November, um, on November 10th on Diderot, the French uh, Enlightenment thinker with uh, Andrew Curran and Philippe Roger from the French department here. And then Melvin Rogers, who has a, a new book on African-American political thought in the United States, will be here at the end of November in conversation with Lori Balfour. Um, our poster is an attempt to kind of capture some of this in part because this is a painting that was made uh, by a French painter as a gift to the Haitian nation when it was founded in 1804. It was sent to Haiti, um, was in the National Palace of Haiti for, for many centuries, it was actually it, it, it collapsed with the building and the earthquake in 2010 and was kind of then renovated and, and restored and brought back to the country. So kind of an example of um, a, a symbol in the country of the kind of continuing struggle uh, to, to realize the promises of democracy. Um, so we are very lucky uh, at UVA to have two of the most brilliant and influential contemporary historians of the Civil War on our faculty, and then particularly lucky to have you here today. Um, I'll introduce Elizabeth Barron first. She'll be guiding the conversation on the book. Um, she's the Langborn and Williams Professor of American History and the Associate Director of the John L. Now III Center for Civil War History a prolific writer on the history of antebellum U.S. and the Civil War, and her books include Southern Lady and Spy in 2003, and Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War from 2014. And we're glad you could do this as uh, you are just about to go off to Oxford University to hold the prestigious Hamsworth Chair of American History there and tell those Brits, you know, a, a thing or two. Um, <laughs> her latest book, Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Defied the South, is coming out with Simon & Schuster this November, so keep an eye out for that. Gary Janey is the John L. Now the third professor in the history of the American Civil War, the John L. Now the third center for Civil War history. Um, she is the author of two books that engage with the memory and legacies of the Civil War, Burying the Dead But Not the Past, Ladies Memorial Associations and the Lost Cause, 2008, and Remembering the Civil War, Reunion and the Limits of Reconciliation from 2013, among many other writings. Um, Ends of War, which we'll be discussing today, was published in 2021 and was awarded the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize, one of the biggest prizes in our world, <laughs> um, in 2022. And she's completing two edited collections, one of which is called The War That Made America, will be out in spring 2024, and also working on a biography tentatively titled A Rebel Among Rebels, John S. Mosby and the Making of Modern America. So Elizabeth will be guiding the conversation on ends of war. We'll have time for Q&A after about 45 minutes. And thank you so much for being here. Marvelous. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Sorry we have to speak through masks. If we're not loud enough at any point, let us know. We'll, we will turn up the volume. So Dr. Janey's brilliant book, Ends of War, is a, is a bracing reminder of how America's civil war is perennially relevant to politics, American politics and global politics. We have here in the book, the themes of defeat and demobilization, of, of amnesty and accountability, of loyalty and treason, of contrition and defiance, and above all of democracy and crisis, which is a, a, a major focal point of this, um, this center here. So let's start by going back to that sort of fateful moment, April 9, 1865, when U.S. Grant's army uh, uh, accepts the surrender of Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox, just a little more than an hour south of here, where, we're, where, we're, where we are at the moment. So you make the case persuasively, powerfully in this book, Carrie, that this uh, surrender of Lee to Grant was not, contrary to myth, 
an ending, a clean ending of the war, but instead the beginning of an interregnum, as you put it. So let's talk a little bit about what you mean by that. Let's start with the Confederate war effort and then pivot to Grant and the Union <coughs> side. So what's the condition of Lee's army at this moment? What's its state of mind? Why is this the end game here, this time and place for that army? Well, first off, thank you, Liz, so much for, for being part of this conversation. <laughs> and I should point out that, that Liz has a, a very important book about Appomattox that was absolutely pivotal to my thinking about Appomattox. So it's a real pleasure to, to get to have this conversation with you. But Appomattox, the surrender of Lee's army, to Grant on April 9th, 1865, I think it's part of the American myth that we need to think about it as this, this clean ending, as this moment where two men stood in a parlor and shook hands, and that was the end of what was a terrible, horrible, bloody civil war. And it's part of the, the myth-making that we need to tell ourselves as Americans Certainly 19th century Americans believed that they were exceptional. And that was one more example of how Americans were exceptional. What other nation could so fight itself and come back together in such a peaceful manner. And that, that's, that's always the image of Grant and Lee shaking hands and this all ends and it's all tidy and clean. And then maybe we jump ahead and talk about the assassination of Lincoln, which follows less than a week later, and that's kind of a, an epilogue to the story, but we seem to think all is said and done. And then we, if, if we are serious scholars, we're thinking about reconstruction and, and all of the, the problems that ensued there. But in the national myth, we wanna see this neat, tidy ending. But if we stop and we look more carefully and we take our time in following out all of the different characters and actors that are part of the story, whether that's the men in the ranks on either side, whether that's the, the politicians um, in Richmond, they're no longer in Richmond, in Washington, and those that are on their, their way fleeing with the Confederate capital south, or the civilians on the home front, black, white, enslaved, free, all of this is very much up in the air, and it's not clear what is going to happen. I think one of the most basic things that we need to keep in mind about Appomattox is that it was the surrender of a single army. It was not a peace treaty. There, there is no peace treaty in the American Civil War. There can't be right. for a host of, of legal and political reasons, but it's it's not the, the end of, of the fighting. There are still armies in the field. There are still lots of questions about what it's going to mean to send, to disband the rebel armies and send them into the, the countryside. So uh, that myth is, is based in the magnanimity of Grant's terms mm -hmm. to Lee, essentially saying to the Confederate soldiers that if they pledge uh, their future allegiance to the Union, don't take up arms against it again, they're, they're uh, uh, free to go home. That's a, that's a simplistic uh, overview that will, um, will complicate. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, the terms of the surrender. Surrender by parole, this has mm -hmm. a very specific meaning, a quite complicated meaning. And you make the case that what's uppermost in Grant's mind as he extends these very lenient terms is to uh, forestall, uh, 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 sort of prevent um, any kind of protracted, irregular style guerrilla warfare continuation of the, of the war, even after a, a sort of formal surrender of, of Lee's army. Um, he is hoping that his generous terms will, as you put it, dismantle the Confederate war machine. But you also make the point that the terms, sort of iconic uh, uh, um, uh, sort of offering of peace on Grant's part, raises more questions than answers. So, so tell us about the terms and some of the, the complexity of that. So the terms on one hand are quite simple. The, the first is that, that Lee's soldiers will surrender themselves, which also means surrendering their weapons and their, their flags. And they will, um, they will be prisoners of war. And this is a really important part that I think we sometimes skip over. These are paroled prisoners of war. They remain prisoners of war. By being paroled, it means that they're going to be sent to their homes. And what Grant does at Appomattox, and keeping in mind, Grant has overseen two other surrenders of Confederate armies, and he does something different at Appomattox than he, than he does <clears throat> at, at either of those, and that is to add 
this extra clause that they will not be disturbed by United States authorities so long as they don't break the laws in order where they are returning to. And in doing so, he opens the door for a whole host of legal and political questions. And he is going to be slammed right away by people um, in the North who believe, both radical Republicans and otherwise, who believe that Confederates have committed treason and therefore he has offered some type of protection <laughs> for them. But what he's doing is, is trying, number one, to live up to what he believes Lincoln wants, and that is the most important thing that that is on his mind and Lincoln's mind is that this is a war for reunion, for union. If this is a civil war. The goal is not to eradicate all Confederates. The goal is to make them want to be part of the union again. And we see glimmers of this in Lincoln's second inaugural when he talks about malice toward none and charity for all, which he's given on March 4th of 1865, and charity in the 19th century term meaning forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so even though it has been a, a hard war, even though there have been policies that have absolutely um, been meant to, to, to lead the South to, to capitulate, to devastate uh, resources and otherwise, in that moment, Lincoln is looking forward. Mm -hmm. He wants white Southerners to want to be part of the union again. And Grant is extending those terms. He's had a meeting with Lincoln as late as March 30th. So, so just, um, just prior to, to the surrender. And Lincoln has told him, you need to be magnanimous. So Grant has all of this on his mind. He's being very practical, but to the, the question of guerrilla warfare, we have to remember that Grant has come from the West and um, he has seen the very violent um, vitriolic guerrilla warfare that unfolded in Missouri and other places. And he is afraid of dispersing soldiers without any parole, any official notion that you are, are bound by this. And I'll add just as a, a side note, we can come back to this if, if it's relevant, that most of these men were willing to keep their paroles. They believed in the honor behind them. Of course, the penalty for breaking one's parole was execution. So there's a, a carrot and a stick here. But Grant believed that paroled soldiers were more trustworthy than unparoled civilians. And he's afraid that if they disperse into the valleys and hills, the Shenandoah Valley and, and otherwise, that, that they could be fighting a guerrilla warfare. And Grant hasn't done too well against partisan type warfare. And it's not just Grant down in North Carolina. Sherman, on the very same day, that Grant and Lee are, are uh, discussing the surrender terms, Sherman writes a letter to his wife, Ellen, where he says, I fear that this is going to devolve into a guerrilla style war. <clears throat> and so the notion is parole all of these men, let's end the war, let's make sure that all of these men are, are held accountable. Their names have been recorded. There's accountability here if we can parole these men, send them home rather than just disperse them. The other alternative, of course, is to round them all up and send them to prisoner of war camps, and that's simply not practical at this moment. So the terms, as you've explained, were intended to change hearts and minds mm -hmm. and to affect remorse and repentance and contrition and therefore compliance with the new order to a certain extent. So, so you, you uh, read so deeply in the sources, the in the moment reactions of Confederate soldiers from the lowliest private to the officers. Tell us a little bit about uh, their mood and how they greet that offer. Do we see a lot of repentance or a lot of signs that repentance is in the offing or do we see something else? We don't see repentance. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of different emotions. Repentance is, is certainly not one of them. No one says that they feel guilty for having fought for the Confederacy. No one says that, that they, if had, they had that to do over again, they would have chosen otherwise. Um, the other range of emotions, there's deep sorrow, there's anger, there's defiance. There are, are thousands of men who, when they get word that Lee is about to surrender, skedaddle, they, they take off. Um, some of them believing that it was more honorable to avoid having to capitulate 
to the United States than to flee from their own nets. There are officers who, who take <laughs> off and, and ride south or ride west trying to avoid the situation. There are, are thousands of the, the cavalry and artillery, so men who have horses, who make their way to Lynchburg. And there the officers will rally them on the night of April 9th and tell them that we will <clears> fight <throat> once more. Go to your homes, await word, and we will, we will fight again. Others are going to try to make their way to North Carolina. And they're going to try to link up with Joe Johnston's army that's still in the field. So there's a range of emotions. There are also men who are absolutely exhausted and, and welcome the end of the war. And they are ready just to go home <coughs> and not fight anymore. So every emotion I would say, except for, except for repentance. Except for repentance. So we see that defiance very starkly displayed in grim and tragic ways in encounters between Confederate soldiers and black Union troops. The USCT or United States Colored Troops had regiments present there at the surrender in the Union armies to, uh, that sort of brought Lee to heel in the, those final uh, battles on April 8th and, and 9th. Uh, they were very proud of that role. Uh, and um, we see, uh, as you uh, describe it, in interactions between Confederates and, and USCT soldiers in the wake of the surrender, um, we see, as you put it in the book, the degree to which wartime atrocities by Confederates against the USCT continued after April 9th. So talk about that theme. So I was um, incredibly struck by the very brazen and blatant accounts that there's Confederates who do who did keep records of their journeys home. And many people stopped writing diaries and letters for, for many of the obvious reasons after the surrender. But some of them were, were um, you know, they, they made no bones about their encounters with the United States <clears throat> color troops. Some of them talked about how they felt insulted that they had to check in at Provost Marshall's offices where there were USCT soldiers. Some of them would simply refuse to do so. Um, they talked about the humiliation of, of seeing a black man in a blue uniform. Um, they were incredibly angry when there were incidents where they would be forced off of a train because black troops needed to, to use that train. Or when um, United States color troops would cut insignia and, and their Confederate buttons off of their uniforms. But there were a group of soldiers from Florida from the third Florida in particular, who were making their way from Appomattox. They, they go overland and by train, make their way to City Point where they're going to catch a steamer to eventually make their way down to Savannah. And so they say years later, and this is a post-war account, but uh, one member of the, the regiment claims that they killed a black soldier that night who had insulted them. They're worried about what's going to happen to them. So they scurry onto the boat. In Savannah, uh, they claim to, to kill several more USCT soldiers. And um, when I was working on the project, I, I had um, a reader who suggested that maybe this wasn't, that maybe this wasn't a reliable source because it was something that had been written in the, the post-war years. And my response to that is, well, even if it's exaggerated, the fact that they're so blatantly talking about their desire to do um, bodily harm, to maim and kill black soldiers because they find it offensive is, is something that I think we need to, to hold, um, hold that and the possibility that, that this might've been an exaggeration. But, but then when I checked Provost Marshall's records, there were incidents in which black men were uh, brought to, uh, to court martial, or excuse me, Confederate soldiers were brought, were court-martialed because they had killed black soldiers on the way home. So that, that yeah. violence that underpinned slavery hadn't gone away. If anything, it's, it's been exasperated. Absolutely. So words of cross-referencing sources as you've, as you've described. So uh, you, you take us across this sort of panoramic landscape of, of uh, the aftermath of war in these early months after the surrender. And among the places where we sort of touch down to look at, again, as you said, range of emotions and, and interactions, 
um, is in border states and places where there are significant numbers of white Southern unionists. These are white Southerners who supported the union. So what are their expectations as the war ends and what are their encounters with returning Confederate soldiers like? The, the border states and Maryland and Kentucky in particular and West Virginia um, as well. I didn't uh, look at Missouri because that was a little bit out of the, the scope of the project, but I was really struck one of the things that surprised me the most in doing the research was the response on the home front from um, loyal um, civilians on the home front in places that had, had been slave societies or societies with slaves that, that could not bear the thought of Confederates coming home, of men who had voluntarily left the states of Maryland or what became um, West Virginia to go fight for the Confederate armies. And so there are, are groups, vigilance committees that, that formed in many of the counties, especially in Western Maryland and significant portions of West Virginia to keep these men from, from coming home. And they publish announcements in the, the newspapers warning these men that they are no longer citizens of, for example, the state of Maryland, that they are not welcomed here. But it went, went more than just warnings. Uh, there were men who were quite literally tarred and feathered. Uh, there was one man, who, one man who was was tied to a board and paraded through town. Um, and then there was at least one incident in West Virginia that resulted in the death of a former Confederate soldier when the, the local unionists found out that he had returned home. So there's a lot of animosity against that. And these, these wartime unionists, of course, hoping that they'll be rewarded at the end of the war, uh, and, and uh, uh, some of them alarmed at the leniency of the terms and at the signs of defiance uh, and, and recalcitrance that we that we talked about, they, those things, uh, those things uh, uh, didn't go well. So you brought up now this theme of accountability. Let's talk a little bit about that. We mentioned that the paroles are a key mechanism here for stitching the union back together, but oaths and pardons also play a role. So tell us a little bit about that and how we can distinguish these, these uh, tools, if you will. Um, and, and how do, what role oaths and pardons played in the amnesty picture help us riddle why there weren't treason trials, why the leaders of the rebellion weren't brought to account. Right, so a parole is for a soldier only. Paroles can only be, well, that's not completely true, but, but in this particular case, <coughs> paroles are issued to those soldiers who have surrendered, who are again, prisoners of war that are being sent to their homes to await whatever is going to, to happen next. Um, a parole means that they can't fight again until they've been exchanged. And that's um, something that, that Lee does negotiate into the surrender terms with maybe looking forward to the fact that maybe the Confederacy could still fight again. But a parole is, um, is, is not a, a blanket amnesty, despite as, mm -hmm. as your uh, work shows us quite well, many Confederates believed it was. Parole also only operated in this since during a state of war. So when there was a legal state of war, a parole would protect that prisoner of war. And, and oblige them and to, to- Oblige the them time. to, to um, not fight. Right. Oaths and pardons and amnesty are a whole different category, a whole different legal category. And as early as December of 1863, Lincoln had issued his his amnesty policy, which was incredibly lenient and said, as long as you took an oath, if you were a white Southerner, you took an oath to the United States government. I think it was his whole, you might've heard of the 10% plan. This is his way of encouraging rebels to lay down their arms and come back to the union. It's a, it's a political tool for Lincoln. After Lincoln's assassination, Andrew Johnson becomes president and there's so many ways in which that is going to, to shape this story. Um, but one of the things that, that Johnson sincerely believes is that number one, states had never legally left the union. Therefore, we're not worried about state loyalty. He's focused on individuals. So he wants individuals to pledge their loyalty to the union once more. 
You can do this through an oath. And at the end of May of 1865, he would issue his amnesty and pardon proclamation. <clears throat> amnesty, um, which I like to use letters to remember things. So amnesty all. So almost all soldiers, soldiers, um, amnesty was forgiveness. That if you take the oath pledging to uphold the constitution and pledging to uh, abide by emancipation, if you are a rank and file soldier below the rank of Colonel amnesty, you, you are forgiven for your sins. If you, once you get amnesty, you can't be prosecuted for treason. Does it restore your political rights to vote? It does. It, it, yes, yes, it does. Yes. Now, uh, there were lots of exceptions. There were 14 categories of people who don't get that, that blanket amnesty. So again, there's, there's that clear um, distinction that amnesty is forgiveness. A pardon is what those 14 categories had to apply for. So people that are excluded from the am amnesty, anyone who has ever served in the judiciary, so Supreme Court, anyone who has ever gone to West Point or the Naval Academy, so anyone who has served for the, in the United States government in an official capacity, a senator, a congressman, anyone owning more than $20,000 worth of property, which of course is targeting um, the, the richest of the enslavers in the South, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, anyone who left their state that remained loyal to the Union and willingly fought for the Confederacy. So if you are a Marylander mm -hmm. or you are from Kentucky, you have to apply individually for a pardon. Once a pardon is granted, a pardon, according to the Attorney General in 1865, because the, the Constitution doesn't say anything about amnesty and pardon. But the attorney general says that a pardon is in and of itself an admission of guilt, but you are protected from future prosecution. So uh, contrary to popular belief, Andrew Johnson is not handing out pardons hand over fist in the summer of 1865. He's actually uh, very carefully looking at those that, that come in. Things will change for a host of reasons by the fall of 1865. But an oath does not necessarily mean that you will get a pardon as the, the man that you've spent some That's time right. writing about. Would yeah. you like to talk about well, Longstreet? James, James Longstreet was a, a second only to Robert E. Lee as in the Confederate chain of command. And so a very sort of diehard rebel who applies for a pardon from Johnson and is refused on the grounds that he's sort of rebel number three after Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. And it's not until... Congress removes the disabilities imposed on him by the 14th Amendment, something very much in the news today as we talk about Trump and his eligibility for office mm -hmm. and so on, um, that, that he's sort of uh, uh, granted the amnesty that will permit him to do something like hold office. Your, your point about uh, the particularly targeting people who had taken an oath to, to uh, as, as, as office holders and servants <laughs> of the US government and then broken that oath of those people in particular being uh, sort of highlighted in that, that, that set of exceptions uh, is, is, is really key of effort here to sort of determine where the, the sort of brunt of the guilt uh, of, of the guilt lies. But there's also this added component of what international law says. And so Grant is going to go to bat when there, there are indictments in the summer of 1865. In June of 1865, Lee and 36 other Confederates will be indicted um, in Virginia for committing treason and leading a rebellion. And Grant is famously going to go to Johnson and argue that, that this, this can't be, that, that we can't prosecute these men. He asked that the indictments be quashed. Um, that doesn't happen. I'll, I'll come back to that. But Grant's Grant is not a lawyer, unlike so, so many of the rest of them. He's not a lawyer, but he is um, implicitly using international law because if you have treated a belligerent, if you have, have recognized someone as a prisoner of war, then you recognize them as an enemy belligerent. And you cannot prosecute an enemy. You can defeat an enemy, but you cannot prosecute them. War crimes are a whole different story, 
but you cannot prosecute them for, for committing treason if you have already treated them as enemy combatants and by calling them prisoners of war, you have under international law implicitly done. So in the name of international law and of his Appomattox terms, Grant steps in to protect Lee and Longstreet. And, 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 when and Longstreet, but it's not yeah. just a personal right. protection. It's not just a personal yeah, protection. It's not just, right. just Grant saying, oh, Lee's my buddy now. Yeah, yeah. This is everything here is premised on us upholding these paroles that we have put in place. And again, here's, this is, becomes a catch-22 that once we've slowed down the time frame that we can see these things, there's no end legally to the state of war. Yeah. So there's that status as prisoner of war is continuing during this time, which means that it actually benefits Confederates for this legal state of war to continue because that blanket of being a prisoner of war is still going to protect them throughout this time. Absolutely. So let, let's um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, John, John Mosby, who you're writing a biography of, uh, and and use his story to further illuminate some of the themes of the book. He he has a very dramatic response to all of this and and uh, and, a, and a sort of fascinating arc to his own life. So tell us about <clears throat> the great guys. So he is, um, he would not dispute that he's called a guerrilla, although technically he is a partisan ranger. His unit, the 43rd Battalion, um, the Virginia Cavalry has been authorized by the Confederate government. He has the endorsement of Lee. So he is operating independently of the Army of Northern Virginia, but still part of the Army of Northern Virginia. So they are soldiers, they are partisan soldiers, but Grant and others will always refer to them as guerrillas. They have harassed and um, otherwise frustrated Union forces in and around the Northern Virginia area. So Loudoun County, Fairfax County, um, all around Warrington, Leesburg, um, and, and elsewhere. And he's been a thorn in the side of Union forces from early 1863 until the end of the war. And uh, some Union generals would accuse him of committing atrocities. He did um, execute some Union soldiers. So there's a debate about whether or not this is a war crime or not. But in April of 1865, he gets word that Lee has surrendered and he's not quite convinced that that's true or that it even matters have all the other Confederate forces surrendered as well. And at first, Grant will say the day after the surrender at Appomattox that the surrender terms, the parole should be extended to all fragments of Lee's army wherever they can be found, except for John Mosby. <laughs> but very quickly, he rescinds that and, and begins to believe that if we can get Mosby, of all characters who's become larger than life in the imagination of many uh, white Northerners, <clears throat> if we can get him to surrender, then maybe we can quell this rebellion. And so he, he asks other Union officers to meet with Mosby. Mosby meets twice um, with Union officials, and he's debating whether or not he wants to do this. Finally, he decides, I'm not going to surrender myself. He disbands his command on April 21st in um, Salem, Virginia, which those of you that might know Northern Virginia is now called Marshall. Mm -hmm. And he rides south, he rides towards Richmond to see what news he can get of, of Lee, of the state of Confederate armies. Meanwhile, the very next day, 300 of his men ride to Winchester where they do surrender themselves. So mm -hmm. Mosby's command voluntarily, they, they take advantage of this magnanimous gesture, of this practical measure that Grant has put in place to have themselves surrendered. Mosby is going to hem and haw. There's going to be a price on his head. He's going to hide out here, um, just, just south of here. He's gonna be in Nelson County, hiding out <clears throat> in his uncle's house. And he starts sending word to Lee in Richmond to find out whether in fact he can um, be paroled because it's becoming increasingly clear to not just Mosby, but all of those soldiers who have yet to, to seek out a parole that it would be in their best interest to do so, that it does offer this blanket protection. Long story short, he will eventually get paroled in Lynchburg in mid-June, but he'll come here to the university. He has 
fascinating life. Mosby had been a student here at UVA until he attempted to kill another student in 1833, at which point he's obviously expelled from the university, uh, spends um, nine months in the, the jail downtown where he reads law. So he leaves the jail as a lawyer, um, as opposed to um, a convicted murderer. Anyway, he's come back to Charlottesville to visit one of his old professors and word gets out among the provost marshal's office here in Charlottesville that the gray ghost is in town and they try to arrest him. And it becomes clear that in fact, he has been paroled and so he's protected. But he's going to face this several times. He's going to be arrested several times in Leesburg, um, in Alexandria. And finally, um, when this happens again in January of 1866, he's still being hauled in, being questioned. Um, it will take his wife going to see Johnson and Johnson refuses to see her, she will ultimately go to Grant and Grant will issue another parole protecting um, the, the man who had once been such a thorn in his side. Thank you, fascinating story. We all look forward to that book. I'll ask a couple more questions then we'll open things up for Q&A from the audience. I'm sure you will have some marvelous questions for Dr. Janey. So, in your career, you've written a great deal uh, about, explicated uh, uh, for us, uh, the, the lost cause, this pro-Confederate doctrine, uh, creed, orthodoxy, form of propaganda, so toxic in its effects on American life. And, and you see, assert in this book that we see in these early days, uh, uh, the aftermath of the surrender, the seeds of the lost cause planted. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, first, when I started on this project, I was bound and determined I was not writing another book about memory. And then <laughs> lo and behold, I ended up finding that the lost cause was, was very much alive and well and, and it's, its most formative years. And I, I think even before 1865, mm -hmm. we, we can see it, but certainly in 1865. And the conclusion mm -hmm. that I came to is it's not just Lee's farewell address at Appomattox that is, is part and parcel of the lost cause mythology of being defeated by overwhelming Northern resources, but it's this attitude and this devotion to the Confederate nation that supersedes any institution mm -hmm. that, that, that goes beyond the, the Confederate government or even the, the, the reality of an army, that the attachment to the Confederacy had not ended when the surrender ended that we see that in the pardon applications, many of these, these generals are adamant that they are not repentant. They are not sorry for what they fought for and they still conceive of themselves as Confederates, even if that is a, a, an identity that has no nation to attach itself to in, in reality. So I think the defiance that's present, their trips home, um, <clears throat> made it even more concrete that, that they, they believed they had, had fought in something, that they had, had no remorse for fighting in this, and the, the struggles that they encountered, the very real struggles of finding food, of finding shelter, or the insults as they perceived them of having to check in with Union provost marshals, and especially if they were, were Black Union soldiers, all of that added insult to injury and just pumped up that defiance. So I, I, again, I, I didn't start out yeah. looking for this, but it became clear that, that all of those seeds were very much there. On, on the subject of the sort of method of this book and, and uh, the new challenges it presented, your, your award-winning book on memory, the book to read on Civil War memory, the, the, the state-of-the-art uh, interpretive synthesis, uh, that's a book that covers, you know, cast of thousands, covers decades, well into the 20th century. Here in this book, you choose to just hone in on really a few months. So what are some of the challenges and rewards of that shorter time frame? I think the, the challenges are that, that there's a, a really deep dive into a lot of different people at the same time mm -hmm. and following all of these different strands, sometimes rabbit holes, mm -hmm. um, in order to flesh out that, that fuller <clears throat> picture. When you're writing about decades, um, you, it's easier to make generalizations, but when you're focused on such a tight period, you really have to find all the connecting dots and the way that, that things come together. But the reward for me was 
I saw things that I had taken for granted or misunderstood in slowing down the time. That uncertainty and the very simple thing that seems so obvious to us that people at the time didn't know what was coming next. They didn't know whether their rights as civilians were going to be restored. They didn't know whether they were going to, to be able to put food on the table when they got home. And that in the moment thinking, it, it reshaped how I think about history of, of having to really put blinders on and understand people in that moment as they understood themselves. Excellent, thank you. One last question for me, then we'll open things up. <clears throat> uh, your book got a wonderful review from Harold Holzer, an acclaimed Civil War historian in the Wall Street Journal in November of 2021. And the review began by pointing up the modern relevance of this story. Holzer wrote, as America's sloppy withdrawal from Afghanistan recently reminded us, the final days and weeks of war and the large scale evacuations that inev invariably follow are seldom if ever orderly. Anyone who still believes that the scenes around Kabul airport this summer were uniquely chaotic must read Ends of War. <laughs> so did you have modern resonances, applications of all this in mind as you wrote the book? And uh, what are some examples of, uh, uh, in your view of some of the main ways the book illuminates or contextualizes modern politics? Yes and no. Um, I certainly couldn't have imagined that the book came out just as we were withdrawing from Afghanistan. At the same time, I had been thinking for a very long time about how wars end. We spend a lot of time thinking about how wars begin and looking at causation. And I, I taught a graduate course when I was at Purdue that looked at how um, wars have ended that Americans have been involved in from 1763 to the present um, using Mary Dudziak's book, Wartime, as a framing reference. If, if you're not familiar with that book, I, I highly recommend it. She's a legal scholar and thinks about what wartime means, that it's like the war on terror is, is never ending, mm -hmm. war on drugs never ending. What does it mean to be in a state of war legally and conceptually? Um, I taught a book um, you might be familiar with, I think it's called Bitter Road of Freedom mm -hmm. yeah. by Will yeah. Hitchcock yeah. in that course. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a great way of thinking about how wars end on a grand scheme. So that had been part of my thinking as I was, was working on it. I, I think that the lessons imparted are just to, to reiterate what I just said, that we spend so much time thinking about if and when to get into a war and not necessarily what it means to extract ourselves. And, and certainly by this point in thinking about Vietnam and thinking about Afghanistan, I would hope that our, our military and political leaders would really think about the messiness that's involved in the logistics, that it's not just the military part that we need to be concerned about, but how this is going to, to affect civilians on the home front as well. And the difficulty of changing hearts and minds always is, is, is absolutely problem. difficult. Yeah. yeah, impossible perhaps. Impossible perhaps. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carrie. And we will now proceed to questions from the audience. We, uh, John, uh, we, we're very happy for you to get us started. Thank you very much. Well, that was such a great conversation. I could listen to you guys all day long. Um, I want to get back to this point of uncertainty that you almost ended on. Um, were Confederates thinking that slavery could be saved? Because after all, it was still legal in the United States, right? The uh, 13th Amendment hadn't been passed. Were they thinking that legal in Missouri, maybe we can get it back in Mississippi? Were they thinking along those lines? I don't know how realistic that thinking was, mm -hmm. but there are absolutely individuals who are thinking that. <laughs> in April and May of 65, one of the things that, that some of these returning Confederate soldiers are doing are trying to find enslaved people that they own and move them and hide them. And so there, there are some that, that are still thinking in that vein. Uh, Kentucky is a case in point. Kentucky, you know, not touched by the Emancipation <coughs> Proclamation. Kentucky is refusing to end slavery until December of, of 65 when the 13th Amendment is finally ratified. Mm -hmm. But there are still um, enslaved people being sold in Mississippi and Alabama in October of 1865. Mm -hmm. So the notion that, that slavery ends 
I mean, I think we all agree now, it certainly doesn't end with the Emancipation Proclamation and it doesn't even end at Appomattox. Um, one historian has noted that, that slavery hadn't died, it had to be killed with a bayonet, that it took union forces being present to, to make it happen. So I, there are certainly individuals that are still making that. Thanks, John. Yes, sir. Reference was made to the 14th Amendment, which is much in the news today, as you pointed out. Can you put the that clause that's in very much discussion today in the context of the of the closing of the war and what who was that it was who was it intended for and is it conceivably relevant today? Do you ask the sure. Part? I mean, I think that 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 uh, that clause was intended to strike at this defiance, intended to unravel the ill effects of Andrew Johnson's presidency, the pardons he did grant permitting Confederates to set up uh, state governments that they dominated and then to elect to join the U.S. Congress, the former Confederate vice president, former generals, for, for, you know, uh, former leaders of the Confederacy to say those people should be inel ineligible. Otherwise, what has the, uh, has the war been all about? It, at the heart of that of, of that um, that clause, and I think of the those who have recently interpreted it, uh, saying that it was meant to to have you know be broadly applicable to a wide range of acts of rebellion or giving aid and comfort to those who are insurrectionists. I'm very persuaded by that argument, but at the heart of that clause is this kind of politics of remorse. The the really the what it was trying to strike at was. Defiance, that is to say, Congress could remove a disability from the, the you know, again, the, this clause says, uh, uh, was meant to punish Confederates by saying that they couldn't hold federal uh, office um, uh, if they had sworn an oath of the kind Harry described as a, as a, um, you know, a, a military officer or an, a, a, a civil office holder uh, before the war, they were barred from holding office again. And the question has arisen about whether this disqualifies Trump as a leader of his own insurrection. Um, the, the purpose of the, of the clause is not simply to punish rebellion, but to punish a lack of remorse. Congress could remove the disability. And in the case of James Longstreet, the third most important Confederate did remove the disability and he did hold office. But so in that sense, uh, uh, they're looking for remorse. They're trying to figure out ways to test remorse, to affect remorse. They're having a lot of trouble for all the reasons that Carrie described. But, but it, in that sense, a sort of a, 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 a you know quest for accountability in the context of this culture that is emphasizing remorse is is is, is I think the way to think about it. Seems relevant today. So most certainly, yeah. Sir. In a way, it seems to me Appomattox was a little bit unusual in that what was left of the Army of Northern Virginia was all in one place under Lee's command. And the situation was very different in, you know, with Johnston in North Carolina or Taylor in Alabama or Kirby Smith in the Trans-Mississippi. How did those surrender processes work? It's a great question. And the, the short answer for what we have time for here today is that that Lee's surrender does provide a, a roadmap and provides lessons learned um, that that will be applied. I, I, Johnston's is the most important. Johnston, as you you note, had his men are are spread out on a um, sixty miles, and so it's not as if they are surrounded by the Union Army the way that that Lee was. But the the writing is very much on the wall. It's also um, the negotiations have just started when word comes of Lincoln's assassination. Um, Sherman will have to tell Johnston about this. And Johnston, for his part, is, is quite concerned as well that this is going to dissolve into to some type of, whether it's guerrilla warfare or otherwise. So, um, you know, Johnston has, has remained in the field, but he is negotiating. He's trying to negotiate for more. The surrender terms that ultimately get um, agreed upon at Durham Station are very, very similar to those they're supposed to be, according to, to Johnson, um, who sends Grant down to oversee things. They're supposed to be exactly the same, but there are some minor differences. 
And just from a very practical level, one of the differences is that every so many men can take a gun with them because it became obvious that men couldn't even feed themselves on their way home. They couldn't shoot a squirrel or a rabbit or anything else. So there are some practical lessons learned, but overall, Lee's surrender provides the, the roadmap for those other surrenders. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to say, I think the hallmark of, of a really wonderful book is, is if it fundamentally changes how you talk about certain historical events or how you teach it. Um, and so now I'm thinking about, wow, how do I teach the end of the, the war? <laughs> um, and like, I'm going to have to go back and think about my lectures, which I think is just a really exciting part about um, being your, your colleague, but uh, being a historian as well. Um, and so I'm wondering how you might recommend that we there, therefore talk about the end of the, the, the war. Like how might we change our language about how we talk about the end of the, the war and the beginning of reconstruction? Because now I'm thinking like, oh, I gotta, I gotta change these, these lectures. <laughs> I think we made reference to that in my graduate class yesterday about changing when you read a good book and make all those marks about everything you have to go change now. Um, well, thank you, Justine. I would say one of the things that I've done in the, the Civil War Reconstruction course that I teach is that I now have a lecture where I think about um, April 1865 through roughly October or so of 1865 before Congress comes back into session in December and really kind of mapping out all of these decisions and debates and things that are on the table, putting in conversation where the black codes come into play in this, where voting rights come in, that once you've been pardoned and, or if you uh, uh, qualify for amnesty, your voting rights are restored. So the states, the different states that are, are having um, elections and how that's part of the conversation to, to Liz's point about electing Alexander Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy to Congress, trying to slow down the narrative and thinking about all these factors that are at play instead of ending at Appomattox and then thinking about what does reconstruction mean? Because it is, it's all part of reconstruction. Absolutely. That's, so that's redefining reconstruction. Point. Absolutely. Yeah, and to say Appomattox, reconstruction is happening at Appomattox. But, you know, I, I think even the way, if you go to the National Park now, the, the battlefield site, there's not enough there now to, to, to sort of let the, the visitor in on, on the, the, this, this fact that reconstruction is beginning right there and then. That was part of the conversation. Uh, you and I were both uh, consultants yeah. for, for Appomattox as they're rethinking their long range plans. And they have all these, uh, uh, you can get your passports. I don't know if any of you all do that at national parks. Um, I love getting my passports <laughs> in different parks, but they have some different themes and one of them is about slavery and they have one about reconstruction. I said, Appomattox is a yeah. reconstruction park. We need to be talking yeah. about what groundwork is laid here that makes certain things possible and certain things impossible after those terms are, are set there. There were other hands for sure. I wanna make sure we haven't missed anyone, sir. And then in the back, yeah. Um. This is a wonderful presentation and thank you. Uh, obviously, most of it was acts of reconciliation to try and get the South to reunite the North. One of those acts was allowing Confederate soldiers to be buried in Arlington Cemetery. Hmm. That's now being undone. In a sense, is the federal government going back on reconciliation? So that happens at the turn of the century. That is McKinley who decides that Confederate prisoners of war, and I think it's very important to understand context here, Confederate prisoners of war who had remained in graves, unmarked graves in and around what became Arlington, that's who's interred in Arlington with the exception of Joe Wheeler and others that fought in the Spanish American war. Um, but so I don't know if that's being, you're talking about the removal of the monument there? And the bodies. Are they talking about removing the bodies? I haven't heard that they're talking and maybe I need to, to do some reading, but I, I'm not aware that they're talking about disinterring the bodies. The monument itself, I mean, I wish we could put up an image of that monument. That monument is um, 
the, that was a UDC in 1914, that monument. It is the epitome of the faithful slave trope of um, a black mother um, holding a, a child and of, of loyal black slaves on the home front. So personally, I find that that monument completely out of place in Arlington National Cemetery. And if you look at the speeches that were given, I mean, what the United Daughters of the Confederacy had to say, the GAR representatives were there too. It is completely lost cause. It is not reconciliationist in the speeches. So I, I am gonna maybe split hairs here and say there's a difference in the bodies and, and providing uh, burials for the bodies that McKinley did as a political incentive to get support for the Spanish-American War or in the, in the wake of the Spanish-American War, excuse me, but in the difference between the monument that's there. Yeah, and Dr. Jay's book on Civil War memory, which shows all these memory traditions competing is, is, is a wonderful way to think about this, the way the reconciliation tradition was competing with others. Sir, in the back, for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It really is, is remarkable. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, you alluded to uh, guerrilla warfare uh, at, towards the end of uh, at Appomattox. Can you go into a little bit about Jefferson Davis's position <laughs> trying to force Lee into into guerrilla warfare into the mountains. So yeah, so as Davis is is adamant that this war can still be fought, even as he keep in mind is on a train heading south to Danville and and ultimately toward Charlotte and ultimately hightailing it out of there, leaving everyone else behind. Um, with the gold. With the gold. <laughs> with the gold. <laughs> All the gold. <laughs> of course still buried somewhere in Georgia, according to a History Channel interview. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I think Davis is, is, is very much holding on to this false hope, but, but Link Lee is, is adamant that this won't happen. Lee has had a conversation the night before the surrender at, uh, with Edward Porter Alexander, in which Alexander suggests maybe we should take to the hills. And, and Lee says, you know, no, that, that's not going to, to do any good. How are men going to feed themselves? How are, it's, it's going to lead, I'm paraphrasing here, lead to, to anarchy. And so um, Davis, is, Davis is, is holding on to, to false hope at that point. Um, he's not the only one that's holding on to false hope, but, but he, is, he is one of the very few that thinks that this is a possibility, that it's a viable option. The more viable option for people is to head west to get across. More men are talking about getting across the Trans Mississippi and fighting with Kirby Smith and others. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, I was fa fascinated thinking about Appomattox actually because I worked with them on this the part about the, the history of the banjo in Appomattox. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Kind of the creator of black right. based minstrelsy. Right. Well, which is interesting to think about how those sites can become kind of larger spaces. But the question I had, um, because I just taught my students the book um, Independence Lost by Kathleen Duval, which is about the American Revolution mm -hmm. and kind of complexifying that story. <laughs> and I was just curious if you had if you had any awareness of whether they were thinking about precedents from the end of the American Revolution. The way that loyalists were treated or not treated. I was just curious if there's a if there's like a legal history in the United States of this because of and I don't I just don't know. I was just wondering if there was any kind of or if they were basically inventing a new thing. Or they had so I mean I, I talk about the surrender of Cornwallis's army okay. at, in 1781 and that that there are certain precedents, certain laws of war precedents that that um, Grant is absolutely following. You know, Washington um, paroled the officers and sent them home with their, their sidearms, but enlisted men went to prisoner of war camps in Winchester and Frederick, Maryland. Mm -hmm. They remained there until conditions got so bad. They remained there for a year and then, then they were sent on into Pennsylvania. The short version of that story is that for two years, prisoners of war from the American Revolution that had surrendered at, at Yorktown are kept as prisoners of war. When it got too expensive to feed them anymore, Congress decided to sell the German, the Hessian soldiers as indentured servants. <laughs> and so very different outcome than what happened in the American Revolution. Um, the other, I, some of you know, I've been thinking a lot about Scottish history for a variety of reasons and Jacobite rebellion and thinking about the Battle of Culloden in 1746, 
And let's just say that's also a civil war in which a very different outcome of, of executions, of exile, that wasn't an option for Lincoln or for Grant because their goal was union and reunion. Mm -hmm. And so if you alienate, you are only going to, to mm -hmm. exasperate the animosity and potentially the, the violence could, could spin out of control. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it does. I, I'm, I'm only just thinking, but I think both the French and Haitian cases are similar things too, mm -hmm. where you have, I mean, essentially this question of can you incorporate into your body politic people who, you know, were against the, mm -hmm. the, right. the project in certain ways. So anyway, Hearts and minds. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that brings us to the end of our class.